Amen. So what am I saying? He took our punishment. That's the gospel. That's the glorious gospel. That's the good news. That's the evangelion. That is the good news, my brothers and sisters. Let's listen. Redemption is the heart and soul of Christianity. Write that down, please. Redemption is the heart and soul of Christianity. If you take away redemption, you've taken away Christianity. You've taken away the hope of eternal life. All of our loved ones who died, who have died into, you know, oblivion. If you remove redemption. Redemption is the heart and soul of Christianity. So the question is, now I'm coming to the main subject. This is where I want to dwell for the next four, few more minutes and then we'll close. First of all, what is redemption? What is redemption? Write it down, please, if you want. What is redemption? Redemption is simply deliverance by a price. What is redemption? Redemption is simply deliverance by a price. By the payment of a price, I beg your pardon. Deliverance. Redemption is simply deliverance by the payment of a price. Okay. Redemption then focuses on how God bought us from our, from our bondage to sin. How God paid the price. That's what redemption is focusing on. Please listen. It views the condition, you know, of a person as a prisoner. It views the condition of any person who is in sin as a prisoner. Prisoner to what? Prisoner to his sin. And when he is a prisoner, listen. He is enslaved. And we see God coming, alright, to free the prisoner by paying the full required price. That is the glory of redemption. Please listen. The Greek word that is used here for redemption means to pay a price to, to set somebody free from bondage. All right? So the Greek word used here in Galatians 3.13, I'll, I'll give you those three words a little later. But just, let, just remember this. The Greek word that is used here for redemption means to pay the price to free somebody from bondage. All right. Now, in those days, in that part of the world, <clears throat> You know, people were bought and sold as slaves in the Roman Empire. Very rarely, <clears throat> but very rarely, you know, you may desire <clears throat> to, you may desire, you know, to buy a slave, purchase a slave for the purpose of setting him free. Very rarely. Very rarely. You would, you know, pay the price of the slave for the sole purpose of setting him free. All right? Let me give you an example. Let's say, you know, you are concerned about a person that was a slave. So what do you do? You go up to the owner in the slave market and you say, <clears throat> you tell him, I will pay you this amount of money for that slave. And so you pay him the money and you take the slave. All right? You take the slave. Now, he has been redeemed from that owner, but he's now your slave. Am I right? Why? Because you paid the price. All right? So, now you buy him and you start to bring him out from that slave market. You bring him out of that area altogether. Then you turn to him and you look at him and you say, I purchased, I paid for your freedom. I did not just pay for you. To be my slave, I have paid for your freedom. You are no longer a slave. Go free. Good God. Good God. You should break out into praise. I tell you, sometimes you have to relieve your sophistication and all that and just break out into a praise because that slave was you. That slave was me. <clears throat> God took me by the hand. Jesus paid the price, brought me out from the slave market of the world. And he took me out of the hands of the slave master, Satan. And he brought me out. And I thought I was going to be his slave. And then he said, listen, I did not just purchase you. I paid for your freedom. You are no longer a slave. Go free. You should, you should celebrate your God. I mean, you cannot be, you know, tongue-tied when you hear these kind of truths. 
I mean, he paid the price, brought you out from that slave market and said, go free. What more can you do, my friend? What more can God do for you than to free you once and for all? Good God, I wish I had a witness in here. Are you understanding what I'm saying, church? Is it too deep for a Good Friday service? You got it? Because you're, you, you're quiet, so I, I don't know which way to go. Listen, now we have been free. That's the word that is used here. What is the word? It, it means to buy somebody with the sole intention to set them free. God, you know, saved us, bought us, you know, not to put us in another dungeon of slavery, but to free us. That is why Galatians 5 verse 1 says, Stand fast, be steadfast in the freedom wherewith Christ has set you free. Glory to God. Amen. So there we have it. You have that we have been purchased, you know, for the sole purpose to be set free. So redemption then is the deliverance by the payment of a price. Am I right about that? All right. Now, everybody in this world is a captive. Yes or no? All right. Everybody in the world is a captive. Captive to what? Captive to what? To sin. Right? Now, sin demands a price to be paid to release its victim. What is the price? What is the price? The Bible says the price or the wages of sin is what? Good. You're very good with your Bible. Glory to God. So, Sin demands a price to be paid if it's to release its prisoner, its victim. All right? It demands a price. What is the price? Death. And the Bible says Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. How? By dying. He had to pay the price. Right? What was the price that he had to pay? How did he redeem us? Here it is. In order to free the slave, he had to pay the price that sin demanded, which is death. Watch this. 1 Peter 1, 18, 19. How did Jesus redeem us? Here's the whole point of redemption. Knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. When he shed his blood, his life went out. You see, the devil didn't know that. He was, moved, he was goading the soldiers to take more blood. Let me tell you, Satan is a bloodthirsty hound of hell. He's a bloodthirsty bulldog from hell. But what he didn't know was the more blood he took, the more he destroyed his hold over human race. <laughs> Because I'm telling you, as long as the blood was locked up in the body of Jesus, it couldn't do anything. But when the blood was spilled, the blood began to speak. I'm telling you, my brothers and sisters, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews that the blood of Jesus speaks better things than that of Abel. Wait a minute. Abel's blood, as long as it was inside him, never spoke. The blood does not have a voice as long as it is inside of you. But the Bible says when the blood of Abel was spilled on the ground, God came to Cain and said, the voice, the sound of your brother's blood, I am hearing. I tell you, my friend, as long as the blood of Jesus was inside of him, nothing happened. But when the blood was spilled, it spoke and it said, it is hallelujah somebody got to thank God for the blood because until the blood came out it did not speak but once it came out it spoke your salvation and mine it spoke your redemption and mine once and forever we are free Hebrews Hebrews 9 12 not with the blood of goats and calves but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all Having obtained uh, eternal redemption. My brothers and sisters. Christ has obtained for us. Eternal redemption. Everybody say eternal redemption. Say that again please. Look at your neighbor and say you are eternally redeemed. Now what do you mean? Now what do you mean eternally re uh, redeemed? What do you mean eternally redeemed? That means 
once redeemed, redeem forever. Oh, come on, help me please. Once redeemed, redeem forever. I can never go back to sin again. I can never become the slave of Satan again. I can never go back to that slave market again. I may sin sometimes. I may slip and fall, but I'm not a sinner. I am made righteous once and for all. If you are redeemed once, you're redeemed forever. Amen. You are redeemed forever. Watch this. You are redeemed forever. From what? Poverty, sickness, spiritual death. Forever. Not for a while. Not for a short season. You are redeemed from poverty, from sickness, from spiritual death. Forever. Somebody holler, I'm redeemed. Ramakasate. There are three primary Greek words that are translated as redemption in the New Testament. The first one is agarazo. A-G-O, if you're writing. A-G-O-R-A-Z-O. Agarazo. Agarazo comes from the word, Greek word, agora. <clears throat> agora means the marketplace. In a secular sense, you will go into the market to buy, to pay a price and buy something. Am I right? Every time you go to the market, you pay money and you buy some stuff. Yeah, right? You see something you like, you, what do you do? You purchase it. Am I right about it? Now, applied to redemption is the same thing. It means being set free. Watch this. Being set free from the slave market by paying a ransom. Amen. All of humanity was in the slave market of sin. And who is the slave master? Satan. Right? The slave market is the world. And the cause for the slavery is sin. And then Jesus comes. Who is Jesus? He is a goel, a redeemer. And he comes to pay the price. Because sin demands a price. And so he comes to pay the price. Why is he coming to pay the price? So that he can free us from the slave market of sin. Free from the evil age. Free from corruption. Glory to God. Free from the yoke of bondage. Free from sin. Free from judgment. Free from death. Free from hell. That's who you are. Somebody holler, I'm free. You're free from sin. You're free from judgment. You're free from condemnation. You're free from being a slave. You are free from hell. You're free from eternal death. Somebody shout hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah. I'm telling you, the moment he prayed, the price that sin demanded, I tell you, sin had to let you free. Sin had to let me go free. That's redemption. The first word is agarazo. The second word is ex agarazo. Ex means out of. X means out of. When you add X to agarazo, it means, watch this, to go into the slave market, pay a price, all right? Pay a price to free the slave, and watch this, and then pay the price for the slave so that he can never, ever be sold as a slave again. Oh, come on, help me please, sir. Good God Almighty. So Jesus came and uh, Satan said, the price is the blood, your death. He said, fine, I shed my blood, I died, I've come to free my man. He takes you, that's ex agarazo. He takes you from the slave market, walks you out. Uh, then he says, keep going. You're never going to come back to this place again. Let me tell you, my brothers and sisters, all of you that are born again, you will never see the slave market again. Ex agarazo is not just paying the price, you know, to free you, but it is praying, it is paying the price to free you so that you never become a slave again forever. Oh my God. Oh, I feel like preaching this more. Jesus, I wish I had time. Everything that ever Jesus did, he did ex agarazo. And that is the very same word in Galatians 3.13. Where it says Christ redeemed us. Christ agarazo us from the curse of the law. Which means not only did he free us from the curse of the law. He freed us so that we are forever free from the curse of the law. The law cannot curse you anymore. The day you put your faith in Jesus. You are free from the curse of the law. 
That's why you cannot say, you know, I, I, I got my father's hereditary problem. Don't buy that. Don't buy that. Because let me tell you, hereditary sicknesses comes under the law. You are not under the law. You are redeemed from the curse of the law. You are redeemed from poverty, sickness, hereditary sickness. Maybe your grandfather and your great-great-grandfather and your great-great-great-grandfather and then your father and then your uncles and then your piripa and your chitapa and all the past got it. But listen, this power won't get it. Are you there? Why? Because I'm redeemed from the curse of the law. I am no longer going to go back to that slave market. All right, I'm running out of time. The third word, the third word is the word latro. L-U-T-R-O, but R-O-O, L-U-T-R-O-O. -O, that's the third word. The third word is, is you know, latro. Latro means to set free or to deliver somebody from captiv captivity. All right, so we have agarazo, which means to purchase. Ex agarazo, which means to purchase and remove from the slave market. And the third word, latron. The noun is latron means having purchased and removed, you are set free forever. Did you get it? The first word, agarazo, means to purchase. The second word, ex agarazo, means to purchase and remove from the slave market. The third word, latron, means having been purchased and removed, you are now set free forever. You are free. You will never be a slave again. You'll never be a slave again. All right? The three words are found in three scriptures. I don't have time to read it. Write it down. Revelation 5, 9. The word, that is per the word purchased there is the word agarazo. Revelation 5, 9. When you go home and read it, the word, you know, with your blood you purchased is the word agarazo. In Titus 2, 14, where it says, He gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness. The word there is latro. And Galatians 3.13, which we just read, Christ redeemed us. The word there is ex agarazo. So first the problem, second the provision. What's the problem? We are all cursed. What's the provision? Christ. Third, that brings me to my third and final point, the purpose. The purpose. The third and final point is the purpose. Galatians 3.14. Why did he redeem us from the curse of the law? being made a curse for us, becoming a curse for us. Why did he go through all the pain and suffering of the cross? Why did he do all that? There's a purpose. Galatians 3.14 That the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. That's the purpose. The purpose in us being set free by Christ Becoming a curse for us is, watch this, the purpose is that in Christ Jesus, three things becomes ours. Number one, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. The blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. What is the blessing that came to Abraham? I'll tell you what it is. Genesis 12, verse 2. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. All right? So what are we seeing here? That through faith in Christ, believers now partake of these rich blessings which God Almighty gave to Abraham. All right? There are seven blessings God gave to Abraham. I will mention them quickly because I have no time. I will make you a great nation, number one. Number two, I will bless you. Number three, I will make your name great. Number four, you shall be a blessing. You see, when it says you shall be a blessing, this is the outcome of being blessed by God Almighty. Not only will you be blessed, but your blessing will overflow and touch others. Did you get that? You shall be a blessing. Then he says, I will bless them that bless you. God's blessings will attract people to your doorpost. I said, God's blessings will attract people to your door. That's what happened. Lot followed, you know, Abraham. And just by going with Abraham, he got blessed too. I'm telling you, when people see you blessed and appreciate and thank God for you, I'm telling you, your blessing is going to pass on to them. Amen. I will bless them that bless you. Sixth. Six. I will curse them that curse you. Seven. In you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That's the purpose of our redemption. That the blessing, the sevenfold blessing that God gave to Abraham is now ours. Why? Why is it yours? Because 
Galatians 3.29 says, Because you are Christ, you are Abraham's seed. And God said, I will bless you and I will bless all the families of the earth in your seed. Who's that seed? Christ, not, not Isaac. Not Isaac. In Christ, the Messiah who was coming, God said all the families of the earth will be blessed. You have got the sevenfold blessing of Abraham because you are Christ. He became a curse for you that you might have the blessing of Abraham. The first is the sevenfold blessing of Abraham. Number two, number two, the second, the second is, the second great blessing that God gave to Abraham, listen, is righteousness. Righteousness is one of the greatest blessings God has given humanity. Because having the sevenfold blessing of all, you know, those great things, your name being made great, I'm telling you, all of that is useless if you don't have righteousness. Because righteousness is a right standing with God. All those sevenfold blessing is to bless others and you being blessed. But when you stand in righteousness, you can stand blessed before God. Amen. Romans 4 tells us, you know, Romans 4, 3 says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So what was the great blessing, great gift that God gave Abraham? I'll tell you what, it's righteousness. He removed the curse, not through Abraham's works, but through Abraham's faith in the same manner. The same blessing of righteousness by faith is ours today. It has come to us through Christ Jesus. Amen. The third, the third, I'm closing with this. Thirdly, the third great blessing that comes to us. That's the purpose of Christ becoming a curse. That's the purpose of redeeming us from the curse of the law. That's the purpose of the problem. That's the purpose of the provision. And that's the purpose. Now, what's the purpose? The third blessing is that we might receive the promise of the spirit through faith. You know, you and I today have the third person dwelling in us continually because Christ died on the cross. Listen, what the blood of bulls and goats and calves could not do, the blood of Jesus has done. You see, the blood of bulls and goats and calves and all of that, it could only cover sin. But the blood of Jesus has removed sin. Watch me as I close. Listen, brothers and sisters, you know, in the old covenant, the Holy Spirit came upon a selected people for a moment, finished the work, and then returned back. He could not dwell in them. Why? Because they were too dirty. Because they were too filthy. Though they, they, they believed in God, they were still sinful. They were marred by sin. But let me tell you, on the day of Pentecost, God told the disciples, wait in Jerusalem. Why? Because once I die and rise again, when I go to the Father, I'll send you a telegram. Now, for you that are of this generation, you are young people, you know nothing about telegrams. You know, for us people, we know in those days, you know, now you have email and you have all this WhatsApp and, and every app is now there, you know. Sometimes I run, I, I'm, I, I'm out of the world. You know, I can't understand a clue to all of these recent app, but there's a there's hundreds of hundreds of apps out there which you can communicate to each other immediately. But in those days, if we had to, you know, go to some place and send a, you know, an information that we arrived, we had to send a telegram. Arrived safely. When Jesus reached the right hand of the Father, he sent a telegram, arrived safely. Because they were all looking at him and all astonished and all afraid where he's going. He said, when I go, I'll send you a telegram. And when he went, he sent them a telegram. On the day of Pentecost, he sent them the telegram. What's the telegram? The Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The coming of the third person of the Trinity. And when the Holy Spirit came, it was Jesus telling them, sending them a telegram. I reached safely. I'm not hanging around somewhere in the air. I'm at the right hand of the Father. Because I'm able to sit at the right hand, I'm able to send you the promise of the Father, which is the Spirit. Now, what is the work of the Spirit? I wish I had time. But what is the work of the Spirit? Number one, watch this. To produce in us a new heart, a new spirit, and a new love for the law of God and a new desire to keep that law. Why did I have to close with that? Let me say that again. The work of the Holy Spirit is to produce in us a new heart, a new spirit, and a new love. For what? For the law of God. And a new desire to keep the law. Watch this. God never removed the law. He only removed the curse of the law. Got it? He never removed the law. We are still keeping the law. But we are not keeping the law to gain righteousness. Because we are righteous, we are able to keep the law. Amen? Now the Holy Spirit gives us a new heart, a new spirit, and a new love to honor the law, keep the law, and by keeping the law, glorify God. But listen, in the old covenant, you had to keep the law to gain merit with God. 
I don't have to gain merit with God. I have already got the merit from God by Christ. So I'm redeemed from the curse of the law. That means when I fail to keep the law because of disobedience, I am not condemned and go get cursed again. Why? I'm redeemed forever. Amen? All of us occasionally break the law. Yes or no? When you lie, you break the commandment. Do not lie, right? When you shout angrily, it's a sin. When you do something wrong, it's a sin. But you're not judged now. Why? Because that crime has already been judged. Your disobedience has been judged and Christ's obedience has been put into your account. So God can never hold you accountable. Please listen. When you occasionally break the law. Because when you cry out to, to for, for forgiveness, he says, yes, I will forgive you because he already paid the price. But that doesn't mean I avoid the law. I keep the law. I keep the law. But not as a means, you know, to gain favor with God. I keep the law because now I am righteous by the blood of Jesus. Because I've been redeemed from the curse of the law, I'm able to keep the law. Amen? Let's go to the Lord's table right away.